topic is on patterns. The executive coaches secret sauce to true business agility. So my name is Victor. Uh, on top of what um, Anu had mentioned, I'm also heading the Singapore chapter for the Open Leadership Network. And yes, um, a bit of a background about myself, she's already mentioned. Um, I work as a um, full-time executive coach and have been coaching agile teams and executives for about a, a 10 years now. And I'm happy to be able to share some of my experience, particularly relating to executive coaching and um, leading transformation with patterns. So that's what we will be touching on. Um, and throughout my presentation, I will also be weaving in um, between the slides and just speaking. Um, so if in case you um, see me cut off the slides, don't be alarmed. Uh, I'll just be speaking to you um, directly. So uh, just a bit of context uh, before we start. Right? Um, executive coaching today has become especially a challenge um, in the era of the pandemic. Now, in this new normal, we are seeing people choose autonomy over returning to the office. We've heard and read many stories and many um, real-life cases of um, people in Google and other companies whom value autonomy above all else, especially in this era. And the pandemic has also shown us that life is short and by no means guaranteed. So people today are questioning their life purpose. They want to be able to lead a fulfilling career and do a meaningful job on top of just perhaps earning a good income. So for the companies and for the executives, there's real pressure today to retain talent and to engage their workforce. So for those of us who are familiar operating in the executive coaching domain, an important distinction between executive coaching and um, standard enterprise agile coaching is that we need to be conscious that executives execute on decisions. And one of those key decisions are around how to allocate decision rights around the organization. And with regards to what I just talked about in the landscape of the pandemic, right? as business conditions continue to rapidly change and to evolve, we as organizations need to learn how to respond accordingly by changing decision rights across, across the organization. And most leadership or anyone for that matter is not prepared to lead this new world of work today. So just a quick recap, a, a, a one-line definition of agility. Right. It, it is essentially the ability to rapidly identify and respond to change. And now we are in the business of navigating the COVID-19 terrain. So what does it mean, therefore, um, for executive coaches um, that are here? Right? So when, when I say executive coaching, I mean coaching executives and not only serving as an enterprise agile coach in the context of organizational change or organizational agility. And one thing about coaching executives that we all need to pay attention to is that we are co fundamentally coaching a high functioning individual. That is how they got there. So for those of us who are familiar with Christopher Avery's work in the responsibility process, right? By high fun functioning, I mean someone who is absolutely capable of taking responsibility, full responsibility within his or her personal purview. And unlike the normal folk, therefore, their job typically entails making decisions all of the time, most of which are micro decisions. And so the value of us as an executive coach shifts in this regard. It's no more about asking professional coaching questions and you know, helping them set OKRs or helping them um, gain greater awareness necessarily anymore. Instead, we continue serving as a sounding board and most importantly, as a trusted advisor. Therefore, if there's any one of us in the audience serving as an executive coach today, you are likely finding yourself in the most challenging of times today in the pandemic. 
right? Like I mentioned, workforce dynamics have sh shifted dramatically in every country and nuanced in every culture. So even today, executives do not know how to navigate in such a terrain. Every organization is its own animal and evolves differently in a rapidly changing environment. Therefore, it is the best test of the organization's agility and the ultimate test of you as an executive coach. So one thing we, we do know, at least as agile coaches, is how hard and how much time it takes to get just one team to understand and practice agile reasonably well. So in the context of organizational agility in an event such as the pandemic, right? Agility in teams do not translate to agility at the organizational level or business agility. And I believe we all know this. If we step back to think about this for a little bit. Right? Team level agility will not get us out of a situation like COVID. And as I mentioned, organizational agility is a lot more nuanced. And what this means is that the same practice may not work well for all work contexts. And I'm sure, again, many of us know this. Therefore, executive coaches who drive or support enterprise change programs routinely find themselves stumbling at implementing scaling frameworks. This is often due to us selecting an incorrect or perceived to be incorrect framework through a top-down Go Agile directive, right? or having inadequate knowledge and buy-in on Agile frameworks at the team level, perhaps because they are not equipped with the requisite knowledge and training, or in the, as is often the case, hiring the inappropriate or um, not the best matching change consultant. Now, this is one thing that I thought would be useful to highlight, especially in this conference um, for everyone, is that there is common knowledge that with coaching and enough change agents installed across all levels of the organization, with the right practices and the right mindset, that an enterprise can be guided to be agile and therefore scale. And as many of us will also have found out, that couldn't be further from the truth. So what's missing, right? What's going to guide our organizational organization to thrive and not just survive? Right? Not getting ourselves toiling endlessly in debates about which agile practices to apply in your daily work or finding ourselves entrenched in all the politics of our local optimizations. So what then? And I contend that the answer to this are patterns, which is the theme of my presentation. Right, again, ultimate test of us as an executive coach. So the secret sauce, patterns. Those of us who have studied Scrum at scale might have heard of this term used in the executive meta Scrum before. So that is an example of an organizational pattern, yes. And Let's do a comparison here. What are patterns? We've heard of Agile Manifesto values, 12 principles, and for practices, we've heard of Scrum, XP, and Kanban. So for Agile Manifesto values, I'm sure we can all agree that these are good values. Uh, we might fight internally with ourselves to embrace these values if they come in conflict with our own values or value systems. And 12 principles, okay, people understand them. But when it comes to practices, we often find ourselves choking with our organizations. And why is that? So just to reiterate, what are practices for Scrum? They would be, for example, the Scrum ceremonies or the meetings, the Scrum artifacts, the Scrum roles. And most importantly, the decision rights around those roles. So for example, in the Scrum Guide, it is mentioned that the product owner's decision has to be respected. This is an example of a decision right. And Scrum 
is a system of decision rights. In XP, these could be user stories or pair programming or CI, CD. Those would be practices in XP. So obviously then, not all practices make sense for every work context. And particularly for chaotic work that's difficult to plan or difficult to plan for, may, may warrant the use of Kanban over Scrum. Right? So I'm sure all of us would have seen some version of this diagram before. Right? This is the Stacy complexity matrix, right? And it's often said that within the complex domain where technological realization and requirements are not that well known, is a good area or work context to apply agile frameworks. Now, for those of us who are familiar with Kanban and the, the notion of work item type in Kanban and what is intended to achieve in terms of optimizing work in progress and flow, we will also realize that Kanban is preferred when we are at the edge of chaos or within chaos itself. And work that entails some level of planning or could, could use some level of planning, iterative planning, Scrum tends to work better, right? So having said that, people choke, right? Because it takes so long to become competent in just one framework, say Scrum, right? There's so many foundational level certificates who come out of their two days course knowing just the basics. And when they actually start implementing, start implementing it, they run into all sorts of um, people problems and resistance and all those sorts of things. So the 2017 Scrum Guide used to say that Scrum is simple to learn and difficult to master for this reason. And as possibly many of us would have experienced, most agile coaches in organizations don't even know the stuff all that well. Or it might be us who think we know the stuff better than others. Right? So now imagine trying to teach this to a few hundred or even a thousand people and getting them to do it well to achieve organizational or enterprise agility. Not practical, would you say? So those who have been on this path would know it. So now, let's come back to how patterns are meant to address these. Patterns are what connect practices to principles. So what do I mean again? So if you look at my screen again, right, today what we are experiencing in all the huckstering of agile frameworks really come across to me as an overselling of practices. There has been a deluge of practices being sold to, to the consumer in the last 10 years. Values and principles, we can take this to mean the Agile Manifesto here, but patterns are what bridge principles to practices. All right. So I, I believe this might sound even more animatic, so stay tuned. I'll go into this further. So I borrowed this diagram from the Open Leadership Network, um, the eight patterns of organizational uh, business agility, or open business agility. And in here, it is described, or in here are described eight patterns, leadership invitation, clarity of authorization, interaction protocols, empirical approach, common knowledge, whole group process, boundary management, and explicit agreement. So now why is it that patterns then are more important when it comes to implementing or realizing business agility or enterprise agility? Right. Um, I'd like to break down each of these just for a bit um, before diving uh, deeper into leadership invitation. So this is a fairly um, broad topic, right? So for the interest of um, this session, I'd like to focus mainly on the keystone pattern, which is uh, leadership invitation. So 
when it comes to let me stop sharing again. So what does leadership invitation mean? Invitations are the primary. So this is what I call the result stack. Invitations are what drives decision-making. So imagine someone, your friend, invites you to his wedding or invites you to his house party, right? By virtue of that invitation, you have to make a decision. That is what invitations do. When one makes a decision, there will automatically be engagement and there will be a result. Either that individual, perhaps yourself, decides to show up or not to show up if it's a small event. But, let me come back to my screen share. Okay. But in the context of organizations, there is this, especially in the context of Asian, organ, Asian companies and, and organizations, there is a habitual approach to getting work done, which is delegation. Now, when it comes to standard and well understood work, as we said in the Stacey diagram, right? simple work or boring work, right? We know how things will happen. There's not much uncertainty to it. Delegation works, right? It gets the results done. But when the landscape is not that clear, people on the ground at the rank and file level would have the working level knowledge for how to get around their problems. And this requires the empowerment and the authorization specifically of their roles in order to be able to perform those tasks effectively. That was so, so essentially, how do we push decision making to the edge? Is the question when it comes to managing and ourselves in a complex domain, especially one that is at the edge of chaos. Invitation does that, right? And I'll get to that later in the context of a particular tool. And explicit agreements, we already know, or at least I would say, many of us will try to do this as a Scrum Master, right? Getting our team, a newly formed team perhaps, to agree on the ways of work or a team level agreement in writing, get it in writing, and getting everybody to sign off to say that they will perform these roles with these responsibilities, that is an explicit agreement. The contract that you sign with your company, that is an explicit agreement. Clarity of authorization pertains to which groups or which persons are authorized to make what decision calls. In other words, what decision rights to this point here, explicit decision rights do each individual in the organization have. Boundary management relates to skirmishes that happen when an individual or team treads onto another individual or team's work. Right. So very quickly, right? this is an example of boundary management. In an organization in which the roles of teams are well-defined, right? teams being A, B, C, D here, right? the well-defined decision rights will be those that are shaded in the center or the nucleus of each circle. Skirmishes happen when there is an, a particular area of work in which the decision right is not well understood. Meaning who makes the decision for this piece of work? Is it A or is it C? Similarly here, is it A or is it D? Right. This is what I would consider a re relatively healthy situation where the skirmishes are far and few in between. Contrast this to this situation 
right? Wherein the 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 decision rights out or the decision rights that each team can make are very narrow. The clear decision rights that each team can make are very narrow, and everything else overlaps. And it's never known who makes decisions for what. And when such situations occur, it's also very difficult to determine ownership and responsibility, which comes back to our point of clarity of authorization. Right? So now we come back to this. The, the next is interaction protocol, which is quite straightforward. So for example, say if now in this virtual world, how do we meet? What do we use? Are we going to use Zoom? Are we going to use Slack to meet? Are we going to turn on our video cameras? Right. Those are interaction protocols. Whole group processes, which I'll touch on in um, a lot of greater detail later. Um, it's especially in, this, in these times in the pandemic where it's very difficult to get physical uh, presence with one another. We need a good whole group process for the purpose of generating common knowledge on the bottom right here. And an empirical approach relates to things like Scrum, right? Um, a, a mindset and, and a culture of experimentation and empiricism is what empirical approach is. So then, how do we implement patterns? That's the next question. This is the focus of an executive coach, whereas an enterprise agile coach or an agile coach or scrum master would likely work with teaching teams and management practices. Executive coaches need to focus on culture development and patterns implementation or installation. Right. So now for, for again, for the reason, for the, uh, well, partially due to the constraint of time and uh, for the focus of this conference, I'd like to pay particular attention to just these three patterns with the keystone pattern of uh, leadership invitation being the emphasis. Right. So the, my contention is that today, of more than ever, we need to engage through leadership invitation. And for those of us unfamiliar with what invitation or the, the dynamics of invitation versus delegation, right? Delegations, which again, us in Asia are really used to, essentially are commands, right? We get that a lot in the military, for example. And commands discourage feedback because the rank and file simply carries out the orders and goes away. They, he or she may carry the order right or wrongly, but in any case, they don't give feedback. Whereas invitations, by its very virtue and nature, generate feedback. Because they're going to ask questions. When you get an invitation to attend a meeting, you have to, and assuming, this is a very, very, very important tenet of a successful and well-formed invitation that I'll cover later is that there are no sanctions for not turning up for that meeting. Meaning you can come and you can go and there'll be absolutely no consequences held against you should you decide not to turn up, right? Such invitations generate feedback and Agile runs on feedback. So um, for those of us familiar with, uh, who are interested in um, the science of persuasion, this is a good link to get a quick read. But the key idea is that this is my ask of you, but you are free to choose with no sanctions again. And then what are the differences between the characteristic leadership types of delegation versus invitation? I, 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 so this, this I have to attribute to Daniel Mezik who came up with this excellent table. We are used to delegation, right? Requiring minimal authority is top-down, depends on formal authority, formal reporting relationship between the sender and the receiver, right? And generates minimal feedback, right? In most situations, it works for the purpose of getting work done, but not for engagement, right? To the, the last three points. 
Whereas an invitation has to be a lot more well thought through and prepared. However, if it's done well, it generates an immense amount of feedback and puts the receiver in charge of what happens next. It sends the required authority right, with the responsibility, requires rigor in design, maximizes generation of feedback, can be used for most situations, gets results, and generates maximum engagement. And so just from this table alone, for the eagle ear, in this case, perhaps, or eagle eye, you may have noticed that one of the fundamental premises for a successful Scrum team is that the team must be able to self-manage and self-organize. And the only way for them to be able to do so is if we give them that decision right to decide their work or their response, decide for what they are responsible for in their personal purview. And therefore, invitations are fundamental to the construction of a successful Scrum team and an agile organization. So I would have liked to ask you in person if you've seen this diagram, uh, this, this photo before, pardon. So this, is, uh, sh this was shared uh, by Jane McGonigal. Um, it's a picture of someone who is on the verge of an epic win. So I'd just like to share her video, uh, TEDx video very quickly. I'm conscious of time, so I will... Um, goes right into it for just two and a half minutes. I'm Jane Manigal. I'm a game designer. I've been making games online now for 10 years. And uh, my goal for the next decade is to try to make it as easy to save the world in real life as it is to save the world. in the real world. Um, but actually, according to my research at the Institute for the Future, uh, it's actually the opposite is true. Three billion hours a week is not nearly enough gameplay to solve the world's most urgent problems. Um, in fact, I believe that if we want to survive the next century on this planet, we need to increase that total dramatically. I've calculated the total we need at 21 billion hours of gameplay every week. So that's probably a bit of a counterintuitive idea. So I'll just, I'll say it again, let it sink in. If we want to solve problems like hunger, poverty, climate change, global conflict, obesity, I believe that we need to aspire to play games online for at least 21 billion hours a week by the end of the next decade. No, I'm serious. I am. Here's why. This picture pretty much sums up why I think games are so essential to the future survival of the human species. Truly. This is a portrait by a photographer named Phil Toldano. He wanted to capture the emotion of gaming. So he set up a camera in front of gamers while they were playing. And this is a classic gaming emotion. Now, uh, if you're not a gamer, you might miss some of the nuance in this photo. You probably see the sense of urgency, a little bit of fear, but intense concentration, deep, deep focus on tackling a really difficult problem. Um, if you are a gamer, you will notice a few nuances here. The crinkle of the eyes up and around the mouth is a sign of optimism. And the eyebrows up is surprise. This is a gamer who's on the verge of something called an epic win. No one... <laughs> oh, you've heard of that. Okay, good. So we have some gamers among us. So an epic win is an outcome that is so extraordinarily positive, you had no idea it was even possible until you achieved it. Um, it was almost beyond the threshold of imagination. And when you get there, you are shocked to discover what you're truly capable of. That's an epic win. This is a game. All right. 
Hope you enjoyed that video. So um, I also post the link to this video, TEDx video on the chat later, so everyone can uh, visit it uh, at your own time. So, Okay, so yes, gaming can make a better world, but what's the, re what's the relevance of this to our discussion today, right? The characteristics of a good game have clear goals or a goal, clear rules, a clear indication of progress, and most importantly, opt-in participation, which is what invitations do or good invitations do. Now, what is a good invitation, right? Like I mentioned, good leadership invitation by the executives or by senior leadership, like a good game should have clear goals, clear rules, clear indication of progress and opt-in participation. Now, um, I've shown you the results stack just now. Again, Invitations by their virtue, very nature, generate decisions, which in turn generate engagement and generate results. Knowing game mechanics, therefore, will help us as agile coaches significantly when it comes to employee engagement and workforce engagement today. So now, how do we engage an organization of over a thousand people? We need to use a large meeting format that achieves the purpose of a whole group process. For example, open space technology. So I'm sure some, many of us would have attended an OST event before. However, in my experience, many OST events did not come with a well-formed invitation and hence, did not achieve its full intended purpose of self-management and self-organization. Now, it's important to note the, um, just a quick recap for those of us who um, have not actually attended one before. Right? The four principles of OST are that whoever comes are the right people. Whatever happens is the only thing that could have. Whenever it starts the right time and whenever it's over, it's over. And the one law is the law, a law of mobility, what used to be known as the law of two feet. If you find yourself someplace you aren't learning or contributing, move somewhere you can. Now, this is the very basics of self-management. What the principles and law articulate essentially is that this is a self-managed meeting. And to make the meeting self-managed, we need to expand the space to make it open while putting in guardrails when it comes to organizational conversations. Right. So before we come to here, perhaps I could share this quickly. So this is, I know this is a bit dark. Okay, so this is an open space technology event. And specifically one for organizations. So what happens is in an open space event for organizations, there needs to be sufficient leadership prep, right? theme development, right? and invitation by leaders. Only then will we set up the conditions for self-management, true self-management that would then be captured in the book of proceedings and committed to by the executive leadership. Sorry, I wrote this here. By the executive leadership. Now, it is the executive's duty to establish the guardrails for what can and cannot be achieved as an outcome of the open space. So for example, if there are unreasonable demands to usurp the leadership or 
to demand a raise or stock options, these things, at the outset of the invitation needs to be made clear that it cannot be serviced. Now, what are the ideal conditions for OST? A burning issue that a lot of people care about, no obvious path forward, where no one has the answer, a diversity of opinion on what to do and potential for conflict, and a decision time for yesterday. Now, in general, the situation needs to be complex, again, um, to the Stacey matrix. It should be used when the situation is as close to the edge of chaos as possible. That would be a good time to use open space. Right. So the outcomes. OST is a whole group process that generates common knowledge initiated through leadership invitation. Right. Now, how do we actually achieve true business agility that actually scales then? Right. And OST is a one-time event. It's an excellent learning event. Now, the answer in my view is OSA, which is open space agility. And uh, the founder of this method is uh, Daniel Mezik. So for those of us who are interested, you can refer to this book, the open, the open Space Agility Handbook. But for the purpose of this presentation, um, we have this, This is the paper point for OSA. Right? Essentially, OSA is an excellent tool to use for the organization to self-manage towards enterprise agility. And the manner in which that is done is to have these conditions, right, which, is, which I've articulated in open space technology, and it's not too different but with the understanding that there is going to be a subsequent open space event 90 days down the road, wherein learnings and ad adaptations by teams and individuals will be captured and shared with the rest of the organization, cross-pollinated essentially across teams and executives. Now, Open space agility is a deep topic. So I would uh, encourage everyone to go to the open space agility website to uh, take a look. Um, the essence is that open space agility leverages open space technology in turn to generate learnings and to integrate or to weave in empiricism throughout the 90 day period, which comes up to about 18 weeks. So, with, these, with this prolonged space of 90 days, wherein teams are permitted, and in fact, encouraged and given the support to experiment with agility or to roll in their own agile practice that is, works best for their context. That is, in my experience, the best way for an organization to get to organizational agility in 100 days. Along with open space agility, uh, these roles, which I'll just very briefly touch on because there's not enough time. There are going to be the identification of these roles, um, formal authorized leaders, informal leaders, which are the emergent leaders in OST, the agile coaches who would coach the teams in their empirical pra practice, the master of ceremony that oversees the entire OSA Overseas in a non-interventional sense, the entire progression of the OSA theme and the teams and stakeholders. So for more information, um, again, I would encourage everyone to visit the Open Space Agility website. And I highly recommend going, considering um, leveraging the eight patterns of open business agility for your agile transformation, especially in times of the pandemic, with the intent to raise engagement and to get everyone to understand how fundamentally powerful each individual is in deciding for the success of not just adaptability and survival, but the success of their organization. 
So that's all. Thank you. Thank you.